work that we do is on a contract basis, uh, mainly for agencies uh, such as the U.S. Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management. Um, we also do work with um, NGOs and private landowners, but, but less commonly. And we work with mainly source identified seed, um, meaning that seed is collected from a specific location, increased on our farm and taken back to that location um, for, for seeding. Um, uh, and that's kind of um, opposed to um, larger cultivated varieties um, that are bred um, and produced for larger scale use. Um, so we have a very um, kind of niche uh, focus um, in our seed production. And as wildflower seed producers, we are dependent on pollinators. So we pay a lot of attention to our pollinators. Um, we do um, import some pollinators, mainly bumblebees, um, for use uh, in pollinating our crops. Um, we also depend on a lot of the native uh, bees and bumblebees um, and other uh, insects that are present. Um, and we also get to take advantage of some background levels of um, re released um, honeybees um, for nearby crops and as well as leafcutter bees because we do have uh, quite a bit of alfalfa seed production in our general area. So um, most of our seed production plots are pretty small, about a tenth of an acre in size. Um, these are a couple of strips of um, showy fleabane daisy, um, you can see being irrigated with handline. Um, we do have a few species that are relatively easy to grow and harvest in larger scale plots, um, such as yarrow and, and Lewis's flax. We've got a few plots of those that are larger than an acre in size, um, but the vast majority of the flowers that we grow, grow are in about a tenth of an acre size plot. And so due to the size, the small size, most of the work that we do is by hand. Um, hand seeding or planting, weeding, harvesting, um, watering, moving around hand line, et cetera. It's very labor intensive. Um, we don't actually water our plants very much. Um, we don't, you don't need to, to get uh, pretty good seed production. We generally only water our plot, plots about three to five times a year. Um, with rel relatively long sets, you know, at least 12, sometimes 24 hour long. Um, and our plots uh, typically stay in for about three to four years before um, they're removed and rotated on uh, to the next crop. Um, just as an overview of what I'm going to be talking about tonight, um, going to be focusing on um, the wildflowers on our farm um, that are relatively easy to work with and grow and should be relatively easy um, to use in pollinator gardens. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the um, observed pollinators uh, we see on each species, uh, but I am a botanist, not um, an entomologist, and um, if anybody sees me misidentify something, please let me know. I'd be, I'd be glad to be corrected there. Um, I will try my best on that. Um, and I'm going to be talking uh, quite a bit about seeding versus planting live plants and which works best for which species um, on both uh, our farm and on kind of native wildland sites um, that we uh, have restoration projects uh, ongoing. And um, finally, I'll, I'll give some recommendations for planting in the home landscape and provide some more resources um, that are, are, are for additional help. So just in general, um, there's a lot of uh, different critters that pollinate. Um, bees, butterflies, moths, hummingbirds, beetles, wasps, flies, they all pollinate flowers. They're all important, uh, a important piece of, of um, pollination. Um, I've read a lot of um, uh, documents for, you know, recommendations on pollinator gardens, and most of them just recommend a lot of diversity. Um, diversity in terms of bloom timing, flower shape, flower color. Um, they recommend 
choosing annuals, short-lived perennials and long-lived perennials so that you kind of have that immediate gratification and um, kind of longer, longer term um, sustainability. Um, I found a, there's a great document that I'll uh, provide a link to at the end um, from NRCS. Um, and they recommend at least three species um, in each of the um, timings of bloom timings um, in both the early season, mid season and late season. Um, having at least three species that live in, in, in each of those time periods and bloom in each of those time periods in order to, to provide that extended um, uh, pollination, pollination source. Um, and so I've actually organized um, my presentation by um, that timing um, with early, mid, and late. And I will talk about um, some species that I recommend in each of those time periods. So um, starting with spring blooms. So this time of the year in our area, I consider spring to go in, into you know, May and early June. Um, that might be a little bit different in higher elevations. Um, but just in general, in the early spring, um, one of the um, most successful species that we've worked with is dusty maidens or Canactus deglossii. Um, I often just refer to as, it as Canactus. Um, and this is pollinated by um, mainly bumblebees and other bees. Um, I, in preparation for this presentation, I found a really neat study um, at the Aberdeen PMC where they um, noted that there were 17 different species of bees visiting the Canactus and their seed production plots there. So um, it really supports a large diversity of bees. Um, it's a beautiful pink to white flower color. Um, you can see here I've got pictures of uh, both a Hunt's bumblebee and a Western honeybee um, pollinating Canactus on our farm. In shrub step sites in Eastern Washington, um, it's generally found on uh, sandy or rocky sites. So it is a very tough um, air, uh, drought tolerant species. Um, and typically blooms in, um, I would say early May. And it's considered a biennial or short-lived perennial, but it does readily self-seed. Um, and it is a species that will bloom the first year after it's um, seeded or planted. So it provides immediate um, pollen sources. Um, a little tricky in terms of um, getting it established though. A lot of the native flowers um, require um, cool moist stratification, which is basically being exposed to cold temperatures um, during the winter in order to overcome seed dormancy issues. Um, a lot of the native forbs flowers have um, dormancy issues that, that require that cool moist um, um, treatment. And so um, this species unfortunately just does not do well when it's seeded in the spring. It does not germinate well. And so it should be seeded in the fall. Um, on our farm, we usually direct seed it into our plot. So we just um, plant it right, seed it right into the ground. Um, and sometime in the fall, generally October, or November, um, sometimes even into early December if the ground is still thawed. And um, we use a similar technique on restoration sites uh, with slightly bigger equipment. And so we uh, drill seed it, which involves uh, usually a tractor pulling um, some, something similar to a grain drill, but adapted for use with native seeds on um, kind of rougher um, native sites, uh, shrub step sites. Um, Canactus does great as a, a transplant from containers as well. So if you do want to plant it in the spring, that's your best bet, use containers. Um, another uh, really easy species to work with, um, actually two of them um, I've lumped together, um, the white flowered fleabane daisies, um, both shaggy and threadleaf. Um, and uh, we've seen a lot of um, bumblebees and other types of bees, as well as flies, moths, and butterflies pollinating this. 
And I believe this is a bee fly on, on this sh um, shaggy fleabane on our farm. Um, they are very drought tolerant, both of these species. And so they're found in pretty, pretty arid shrub step sites in central Washington. Um, and again, bloom kind of in the mid to late spring. So May to, May to late May, early June. Um, seeds of fleabane do not have dormancy issues. And so they could be seeded in either the fall or spring. So they are one species that's a little bit easier to work with, uh, a little bit more flexibility in terms of when they can be seeded. Um, they also do really well from container as well. Um, this is a plot on our farm that we actually seeded into little holes in this um, poly mulch material. And uh, we use this a lot just to kind of cut down on um, hand weeding and um, the need to apply uh, herbicides and that sort of thing and, and just, just to reduce labor. Um, Fleabane daisy has tiny, tiny seeds. There's generally about uh, one to two million per pound. And so on wildland sites in restoration projects, we seed it at a tenth of a pound per acre. Um, so, you know, there's really, in most situations, there's never a need for more than, you know, a quarter of an ounce, if, if that, of, of this seed. Um, another early uh, season flower, um, really like to work with this one, white leaf phacelia, also known as silver leaf phacelia. Again, this is a picture um, of some plants established in that um, poly mulch on our farm. Um, lots of bees, different bees pollinate phacelia, bumblebees and other solitary bees. And um, like the flea banes, it's very drought tolerant and it's typically found naturally on very sandy or rocky sites um, in shrub step and even up into um, kind of ponderosa pine woodland. But it does have dormant seed. And so um, it needs at least 60 days of exposure um, to winter conditions. And so um, when it's seeded, it should definitely be in the fall. Um, and we do a lot of seeding of phacelia as opposed to um, container planting. Um, we direct seed it on, into farm plots as well as uh, drill seeding it in our, our restoration projects. Um, that's not to say you can't do it from, con you can't transplant from containers. That works really well as well. Um, phacelia tends, makes a really nice um, container plant, uh, does well from transplant. Um, and there is a different species that occurs at slightly higher elevations in the mountains um, that's very similar in um, characteristics and um, might be available as well. And that's uh, very leaf Phacelia or Phacelia heterophylla. Uh, so this is another option if you're a slightly higher elevation. And then I think this is my last early spring flower and um, this flower is kind of on the bridge between early and mid, um, typically flowers in late May or early June. Um, Monroe's globe mallow, uh, I won't try to pronounce the scientific name because I will butcher it, I'm sure, um, but tremendous uh, host to bumblebees and bees, butterflies, flies, etc. I've got a picture of um, a bumblebee, I believe that's a brown belted, I could be wrong, and I think, a, I think some sort of sweat bee. Um, it's, it grows naturally on a wide variety of soils within the shrub step. Um, it seems to do well on sandy soils or even gravelly soils, so it's pretty adaptable and, and very drought tolerant. Uh, it unfortunately does have a hard seed um, that requires pretreatment um, prior to seeding. Um, it's got kind of a thick seed coat that um, doesn't really let water in. And so what we do is we kind of lightly sand it, rub um, some sandpaper um, over the seed and just rough it up a little bit. And that's enough to kind of um, nick the seed coat and allow that water to penetrate um, the seed coat and, and germination to begin. So something to keep in mind um, 
We generally don't sell seed <clears throat> pre-treated. Um, I'm not aware of other vendors that do in this area. So um, that if you decide to seed the species, that would be something that to take on yourself. <clears throat> um, we typically um, don't seed it directly into the ground. We seed it into containers um, in <clears throat> four cubic inch uh, little tubes that we, uh, excuse me, that we leave out over, over the winter, um, put them in the greenhouse for a few months in the late winter, early spring, and then transplant them into fields. Um, that's what we do on the farm. We also transplant <clears throat> transplant 10 cubic inch seedlings of it on our restoration projects, um, it, but we also drill seed it as well. So um, it, can, it can be either seeded or uh, transplanted um, as a live plant if you don't want to deal with the seed coat issues. <clears throat> okay, and then moving on to early to mid summer blooms. I've got a lot to cover here. Um, Lewis's flax, uh, beautiful showy blue wildflower, <clears throat> not to be confused with um, blue flax, which some vendors um, call it blue flax. Um, and so, but blue flax is also the name of a European variety of flax. And so, um, be really careful when you're ordering this to make sure it's Linum louisii um, that you're getting as opposed to um, the cultivated variety. Um, great source of pollen and nectar for bumblebees, other bees, um, and flies in particular, and it blooms in the early summer, um, usually June and July. No dormancy issues, no hard seed coat issues. It can be seeded directly in either the spring, uh, fall or spring and does really well from both by seed and from container plants. Uh, we actually planted an eight acre field of this um, on our farm. It's one of the biggest fields of flax um, that we've ever done. And if anybody wants to see it, it'll be in its second growing season this year. Um, just drive down to Warden. It's right on the, right on road U. It'll be hard to miss in July, I think. So um, we usually direct seed this, um, on our farm and it's a, it's a part of a seed mix uh, that we drill seed into restoration sites. Uh, it doesn't generally bloom the first growing season after seeding, um, so you have to be a little bit patient with this one, it, but it will bloom the second year. Um, buckwheats are some of my um, favorite plants to grow in the garden just because they're, um, they're, not only perennials, but they're kind of um, kind of low growing shrubs. And so they retain their leaves year round. And so they provide year round interest. Um, two species that grow in Eastern Washington and flower in kind of the early to mid summer are Wyeth's buckwheat, um, also known as parsnip leaf, also known as creamy. It's got a lot of common names, um, but this is white or pink flower color. Um, and sulfur buckwheat, uh, which has the kind of the vibrant yellow flower color, but um, beautiful foliage, um, great plants for rock gardens or just for you know inclusion in your in your home landscape. Um, Wyeth's buckwheat typically grows on pretty good loamy soils um, and moister sites and shrub step. And I've seen sulfur buckwheat grow in a lot of different places. Um, from really rocky sites to um, subalpin, um, um, you know, hillsides. It's it's a pretty diverse species. It, it grows in a lot of different areas naturally. Um, buckwheats do require that stratification uh, in order to germinate. Uh, generally, between sixty or ninety days of cold moist of cool moist stratification um, is needed. Um, so. We typically recommend uh, transplanting um, these species. In other words, um, you know, you can seed them into pots or just purchase them in pots and plant them as seedlings, um, either you know, three and a half inch pots or 10 CI or 40 CI, whatever, whatever is available in your area. Um, when we grow them in our seed production fields, um, we seed the containers 
in the fall, overwinter them outside and grow them in the greenhouse for a few months before we transplant them into the fields. Um, we do a lot of the transplanting by hand, um, but we do have a mechanical transplanter as well for larger fields. And uh, we primarily uh, transplant this as 10 cubic inch uh, seedlings in restoration projects. Um, and we, we try to do those in the fall um, just in order to have more season of, you know, greater moisture uh, for establishment. Um, spring planting would work in a lot of areas as well. Um, occasionally we drill seed these, uh, but I think containers are the, uh, the safest uh, bet for establishment. And these are just a couple of pictures of uh, a YS Buckley seed production plot. Um, this was actually in 2011, so it's been a few years. Um, but uh, the picture on the left, you can see the variety of um, size, and you can't see it as well, but there's a lot of variation in um, leaf color and size and shape and flower color. There's just a lot of diversity in this uh, particular um, plot, and that's kind of what we aim for, the BFI. Um, most of the work that we do is by hand, but this is kind of a fun picture because we actually swath this stand of Wyatt's, um, which means we cut it pretty low to the ground and windrowed it. And then I believe we pitched all of the windrowed material onto trailers and took it to kind of dry before we cleaned the, cleaned the seed down. So we try to incorporate general farming machinery whenever you know a, a field is big enough to warrant it or or um, the seed cooperates it stays on the plant long enough to be harvested like that um, of course i have to mention lupin um, one of one of the showiest species we have um, fantastic source of pollen and nectar for bumblebees and bees and butterflies, hummingbirds, etc. I believe this is a Hunt's bumblebee and this is a, a broadleaf lupin patch that we have on the farm. Um, three of the species of lupins that we've worked with that are relatively easy to work with um, are broadleaf, silky, and big leaf. Um, and I don't include sulfur lupin in that, although that's a really common species that's seen. Um, We've just had challenges with that agronomically. It's hard to grow, to get it to produce seed. So um, there just isn't a lot of seed available for this one. Um, so uh, that's it's a little tougher one, but but these three, these blue flowered uh, lupins um, do pretty well in production plots. Um, broadleaf lupin is of course, you know, common in forested areas. Silky lupin grows in both shrub step and kind of more woodland sites. And big leaf lupin, um, I think, is pretty widespread, but I, I see it growing a lot in moister areas, such as straws um, within shrub step. Lupin is a challenge to establish. Um, I'll just say that. And like I said, with some, some species of lupin, they just are not productive. Um, it's definitely, um, it should definitely be seeded. Um, we've, we've had challenges over the years trying to grow it in containers. Um, Lupin and, and a few other natives um, have really dominant tap root, um, root structures without a whole lot of um, like fibrous roots or fine roots um, that really form a nice um, root container, root tight um, container. And so they're challenging to transplant. Um, they tend to break when you're transplanting and then it leads to a lot of mortality. So um, a lot of vendors, uh, nurseries don't sell lupins in containers or they've got very limited uh, selection, just a, one or two species when there's you know, a large diversity of lupins um, in our area. Um, we, so we seed it into our plots on the farm and we drill seed it on our restoration projects. Um, we do not do seed treatments to lupin, although I've heard of folks um, using seed treatments like a boiling water soak um, and that helped, but we found over the years that um, it really wasn't necessary as long as it was seeded in the fall. Um, one of my favorites, I think I've said that for every species so far, but I think they're all my favorites, but this is a particular favorite, um, showy flea-bane daisy. 
um, really popular with bumblebees, flies, moths, butterflies. Um, it's found it in a little bit more music sites than kind of um, typical shrub stuff sites. It's more of a forest or woodland species typically, and it blooms in the kind of early to mid summer time frame. Um, and like the other flea beds I mentioned, uh, no dormancy issues in the seed, so it can be seeded in the fall or spring, and it does great seed or container. Again, tiny seed, you don't need much. Great pictures of a western honeybee and a, some sort of leaf cutter bee, um, I believe, on the right hand side. Um, Penstemons are, of course, very popular choices for uh, pollinator gardens. There's so many species that um, all do pretty well on our farm and in wildland areas. Um, this is just a few that we work with that um, are, you know, Eastern Washington focused. Um, most of them have that kind of bluish purple flower color and they're great hosts for the bees, moths, butterflies, etc. Penstemons are just prolific nectar producers, so they're a really important choice um, in pollinator gardens. Um, they're a little bit more challenging to establish, unfortunately. They do have seed dormancy issues, and so that cold moist uh, treatment is necessary. Um, and they also do best when planted with container stock. So on the farm, we seed containers and then transplant them to the fields. And in your garden, you know, I would recommend planting containers and you could do that in either the spring or fall, um, depending on um, when you're interested in gardening. Just a couple more pictures here. I'm going to try to speed up because I'm, uh, I think I'm talking a little bit too much. I just get too much information to impart here. Um, and then last, last um, section, um, timing, bloom is kind of the late season. Um, there's not as many species that bloom at this time of the year. Um, one that we've started working with recently is giant blazing star, Menzelia. Um, I have the wrong species name in there. I just noted that it's a uh, Labacolis, not Albacolis. Um, apologies. Um, this species attracts um, typical um, Bumblebees, hummingbird moths, um, butterflies, bees, moths, etc. I've got a great picture here of a, a hummingbird or sphinx moth um, on um, a, a blazing star. Those are just the most amazing um, insect. Um, they're called hummingbird moths because if any, of, any of you haven't seen one, they are literally the size of a hummingbird. Um, really, really cool to encounter those. Um, flowers kind of towards the end of summer in the Columbia Basin and really arid or drought tolerant species. It's found on, you know, gravelly um, canal banks and um, really rocky sites. And so, um, yeah, it's just a very um, hardy plant. Um, we haven't worked with it a ton, but it does seem like it has some dorm seed dormancy issues. And so, um, would recommend seeding it in the fall and using seeding as the um, establishment method rather than transplanting because it does tend to have that sensitive tap root um, that I mentioned with the lupins. Uh, you could do containers, but you just want to be careful um, when transplanting them um, to, to preserve the tap root. Um, of course, everybody's familiar with this species, um, blanket flower. It's ubiquitous across, um, you know, the Western and Midwestern United States. Some of them have this really reddish inner, you know, color on the disc, or I'm sorry, on the ray flowers. And some of them are just yellow. And it's just, you know, there's a variety within the ecotypes and within, um, just within, um, you know, plantings. Uh, so there's just a lot of variety in color in this one and tremendous um, pollen source. You can see the bumblebee just coated with it in this picture here. Um, I found it in kind of more moist uh, shrub step sites in woodlands in Eastern Washington, maybe not like central Columbia Basin, but a little further east and north as you get into a little higher precipitation. Uh, but it blooms throughout the summer uh, so it's a really important um, pollen source later on. It's got an extended bloom. It's, um, it's a great species, highly recommend it. Um, 
no dormancy issues, so it can be seeded in the fall or spring. Does great from seeds or containers. Um, just a relatively easy species to work with. I think the thing to think about to remember with with blanket flower is that um, because it's so easy to work with, um, there's a lot of commercial sources um, that you know you may they may come from the Midwest or from another area, um, and that might not matter to you. Um, and that might be fine for a garden, but um, for you know our restoration projects, we try to use as local of you know seed source as possible. Um, great picture of this metallic sweat bee just coated with pollen, and uh, I think this is a furrow bee. Um, the only annual I actually have to talk about today is um, annual sunflower, and again. It's just the sphinx moth um, is all over this plant um, in our, in our, at our farm, um, as well as just, it's loaded with bees, um, really amazing uh, uh, host plant. Um, it, uh, it blooms all the way until it frosts, until it, through the fall. So um, late summer, early fall, it's just got an extended bloom time. Um, really hardy plant too. Um, it, I see it a lot along roadsides or in, you know, along gra around gravel parking lots. Um, so it, it seems like it likes a little bit of disturbance because um, it, it needs to self-seed itself. Um, and it also grows really well in areas like along Crab Creek or other, um, you know, areas where there's some um, extra moisture in the late summer. But you have to have room for this one because it can get to be over six or even over eight feet tall. Um, but uh, you, you often find it, you know, three or four feet tall as well. It just kind of depends on how much moisture it's getting. Um, no dormancy issues. It's an annual, so obviously it's seeded. Um, you can plant, you can seed it in the fall or spring. Again, um, Lots of cultivated varieties of this exist. And so your best bet of getting a Washington uh, native seed source is to shop with a local uh, seed vendor. Um, I think I've got two more late season plants. Um, Rory tansy aster is, I think, kind of a neat little plant. It generally gets about three feet tall. And it's um, interesting because it often gets mistaken for spotted knapweed, but um, it's got, you know, yellow, um, yellow disc flowers. So that really sets it apart. Uh, but it's uh, pollinated by a lot of different types of butterflies. We've seen so many butterflies on this um, species late in the summer, as well as, uh, you know, bees, flies, moths. Um, it's a biennial or a short-lived perennial and it self-seeds pretty readily. It, it again is a species that will flower the first year. And it's blooming all the way through September. Uh, we typically harvest it in October. So uh, this is a production field in, in mid-September. Um, so you can see it's in full bloom. Um, and we generally establish this from seed, um, but it does need to be seeded in the fall. Um, because it does have some seed dormancy issues. And I think this is my last one, another buckwheat. Um, these ones are just so fun to garden with. Um, really common um, pollinators on buckwheats are, you know, the bees. Um, I think this is a striped sweat bee um, on this, um, on this Ariagnum uh, flower, and then another uh, type of bumblebee. Um, they have kind of a white to pinkish color flower, uh, some variability in flower color there, uh, but very beautiful grayish green foliage that um, is evergreen. Um, they're, um, I think, you know, two to, you know, 24 to uh, 30 inches tall, so a little bit bigger, and they can get, you know, somewhat round and large as well. So um, definitely need the space to grow them. Um, like the other buckwheats, they need that cold moist stratification. So any seeding should be in the fall, but probably best to um, consider containers um, uh, for establishing in, in the garden. 
And there's a lot, there's so many more species. We don't have time to go over all of them. Honorable mentions, um, but I just didn't have great um, pollinator pictures of. Um, Western yarrow, of course, really easy to grow, widely available flowers throughout the summer. Um, you can seed this, it doesn't have dormancy issues or you can plant a container. Um, Oregon sunshine um, flowers kind of in the late spring and we generally recommend containers for this species. It's beautiful yellow disc and ray flowers that are pretty small. Um, uh, the golden rods are also really um, highly recommended for pollinator gardens. Um, both Missouri, which is kind of more of an upland species and um, Canada, um, which is more of a kind of found along the fringe of wetlands in Eastern Washington. Uh, another late summer um, flower, so um, can be important um, in for that time of the year. Um, I would definitely recommend containers for these. And um, we don't work with them because um, we're seed producers, but um, flowering trees and shrubs are such an important um, source of pollen and nectar, particularly really early in the year. I've got Oregon grape and scowler's willow and current in my yard that's been flowering for over a month. Um, so um, there's some of the earliest uh, flower flowering um, plants um, in the basin. Um, so really important to include. Um, we generally would recommend planting a container, you know, 40 cubic inch gallon size that, you know, thereabouts. Um, and you can plant those, um, you know, spring or fall. Oh, and I forgot to mention rabbit brush. I see another um, another shrub that, and it flowers all the way, I think into uh, September, even early October. Um, another, you know, um, category of, you know, I would call great pollinators, but maybe tricky plants to, to include in a garden. Um, and, you know, at the top of that list, um, I have to mention balsam root. It's in full bloom right now. There's just landscapes carpeted with it right now. You know, like the lupins, it's got a really sensitive taproot, doesn't make a really great container. Um, so, it's, you know, a lot of nurseries have moved away from providing it. It's just a challenging species to grow in a container. Um, but unlike lupin, it's also very challenging to grow from seed. Um, we have a seed production plot. Well, actually, we don't, we don't anymore. We took it out, but we had one. Um, and from seeding to flowering, from when we seeded the ground to when it flowered and made seed, it took six years. And that was with irrigation. So it's just a very, very slow growing species to flower. So, you know, by all means, get some seed, plant it but be patient, um, it's gonna take a while to materialize. Um, Phlox is another challenging one, it's also flowering right now, but the seed um, shatters explosively, so it's hard to harvest and um, it just isn't available. The seed is just too hard to get sometimes. Um, and the desert parsleys are also challenging to propagate. Their seed has kind of extended dormancy so we plant them in our fields and they come up over years, you know, a little comes up the first year, a little the second year, a little the third year. And so it's just hard to uh, be able to produce um, enough seed and, and they also don't make good, great containers and they don't germinate well in the containers because they're just very heavy, very extended germination period. Um, and with that, I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about planting versus seeding, which I've kind of already covered extensively on a species specific basis, but just in general, um, we try to um, save, you know, seeding for kind of larger scale projects, um, projects where you're using mainly grasses, um, just because of dormancy and hard seed issues that are associated with forb and shrub seed. Um, Whereas with live plants, um, you know, those are still cost, they're more expensive, but they're pretty cost effective when you're just talking about a, you know, a small or medium, medium sized project, like a, like a backyard or a small, um, small habitat planting. Um, and they're just, it's just critical for a lot of the forbs and shrubs that are challenging to um, uh, establish by seed. Um, and then I'm sure of, anyone who's ever gardened seeds are just require a lot more work to get going because they need um, substantial 
site preparation work, you know, in a form of weed control, whether that's solarization, chemicals, mechanical, um, you need to really be able to deplete the weed seed bank in order to kind of eliminate the competition so that seeds can establish. Um, you also need bare soil and the seeds should ideally be buried just a little bit under that soil. Um, so yeah, it takes a, lot of, takes a lot of work to get to that point. Sometimes in our restoration projects, we spend two years usually following a site um, to reduce the seed, weed seed component before we seed it. So um, that can be sped up with irrigation and the landscape, but um, it's, it's, um, it requires a lot to, to prepare, prepare a site for seeding. Obviously, live plants need a lot less site preparation and weed control because the plants are just larger and more competitive when they're planted. Um, the Washington Native Plant Society has a great up-to-date source of where to buy native plants and seeds. And so this is the link. Um, and you can see they buy native seeds right there at the top. Um, perks of being, um, uh, starting with the letter B, I guess. So. Um, if you are wondering where to buy native plants or seeds, this is the best source that I've that I found. Um, tremendous resource. Um, and again, I've talked a lot about timing, but it's really critical to know what the proper timing is. Um, most seeding is best done during the dormant time of the year, which is when it's cold and when things aren't growing. Um, and so that's in our area, that's fall through, you know, late winter, you know, January, February, um, because that's when the most, most moisture is. And so, you know, the seed needs to be able to germinate in high moisture conditions and establish before summer drought kicks in. So timing is really critical for seeding. Um, planting is much more flexible. You can do it in the fall or spring or even early summer. Um, and as long as you're irrigating it, yeah, you can, you can plant at most times of the year, although um, you know, probably best to stick, stay away from the hot summer months. Um, it's just challenging to get anything to survive when it's hot and sunny like um, it is in Eastern Washington. Um, most native plants really don't need much in, in terms of fertilization provided that your site, you know, your yard has pretty decent topsoil. Um, if you want to fertilize, you know, I'd recommend like a slow release or compost um, applied to the soil surface or you could work the compost um, into the soil, uh, but again, it's not really critical um, if you've got intact uh, topsoil. And irrigation is kind of the same. Um, if you if you have a droughty site and you pick drought tolerance uh, drought tolerant plants, your irrigation needs will be pretty minimal, um, probably the most in year one and um, less so after that. Um, I use a pretty much drip irrigation exclusively in my yard. Um, broadcast irrigation or sprinkler irrigation is, is okay for like large seeded areas. Like if you were doing like a, you know, a native turf, but it just kind of creates a lot of weeds in um, other areas. So with that, I just want to share a few final thoughts. Um, there are a wide variety of native pollinator host plants that are commercially available. Um, and so um, if you are interested, um, the Washington Native Plant Society um, has an up-to-date list with all of the sources and contact information. Um, and there's also a lot of sources or experts that are available to help with plant selection or you know, um, to you know, help, you, help you choose the species you want. And, the local nurseries or seed vendors are a great source, as well as the um, your chapters of, of Washington Native Plant Society. Um, live plants or containers are probably going to be easiest to work with for most wildflowers and flowering shrubs. Um, seeding works for a few species, um, and generally it's best in the fall. But but containers are probably um, the easiest bet overall. And again, choose a, choose a large diversity of flower colors, shape, bloom timing, so that it, you've got you know, bloom coverage throughout the growing season. Um, I have found that a little bit of extra water will extend bloom times as well. So something to consider if you um, have the ability to you know, do some limited watering or drip irrigation. Um, a little bit of extra watering, not too much, because these are 
plants that are not adapted to a lot of summer water, but um, you know, a little bit will help. Uh, sources that I mentioned, um, plants for pollinators in the inland, inland Northwest by the NRCS Plant Materials Center in Pullman is a great resource for ideas for different <laughs> pollinating species, um, as well as uh, this U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, booklet that I found that not only talks about like the pollen nectar producing plants, but gives you some other habitat ideas for, you know, how to provide, you know, habitat for ground nesting bees or, you know, maintaining, you know, sticks and foliage for stick nesters. So just something that um, is, is important to think about if you want to provide other habitat features than flowers. And lastly, uh, BFI um, produced this great um, handout in 2020. Um, Kelsey Prickett, our former seed production manager, produced this. And um, if anybody is interested in receiving this, just shoot me an email um, or go to our website. Um, there's contact information as well. Um, and with that, I will take any questions. Oh, thank you. That was wonderful, Mel. Um, it was just so nice to see all those sunny flowers in eastern Washington and uh, and really enjoyed all the useful information. So thank you for that. So um, everybody that's out there would like to put something, uh, comment in chat or question in Q&A. You have a minute or two to do that. And we have one comment from Heidi that says, so much helpful information. Thank you. And we have a question from Heidi. Have you seen the species of interest change through time? Um, <clears throat> there's definitely, um, yeah, that's a really good question. I, I'm, I'm not sure we've been in the pollinators market long enough to see much change. Um, it's it's still relatively new in our area. Um, we've really only been growing a lot of flower seed on our farm um, since 2010 when when Kelsey Prickett was hired. We were growing yarrow before that, but that's it. So um, I would say the main cha change that I've seen is that there is an increasing desire for just diversity. And a lot of the agencies are willing to, you know, contract with us to grow you know, a obscure plant and, and, you know, a lot of different, different flowers um, just for the sake of pollinators or other um, habitat. So I think, yeah, just there's a, a move towards more diversity in general, and that's really good. Okay, we have one more, one more question. Does BFI sell seeds on a retail basis? Oh yeah, we'll sell seed to anybody. Um, just call our office. We're not really set up to do um, like seed packet type sales. We've tried, you know, making like very small packets and selling them, but they're just there hasn't been in the past the demand. Maybe it will get there someday, but um, we will sell seed on an ounce basis, and we'll sell seed to you know whoever um, wants to call us up and buy it. So um, yeah, feel free to call Matt at our office um, if you're interested in buying small, you know, at least an ounce worth of seed. Okay, and I have a question. Do you ever give tours out on your farm? We do, yeah, yeah. Pre-COVID, we had one to two tours open to the public every year. Um, and I imagine we will again, um, okay. maybe starting next year. Um, I don't think there's one planned for this year, but it's generally in early June. Mm -hmm. And um, we look at the flower fields and all of the grass fields and it's just, yeah, it's neat. And if you're interested in being a part of that, email or contact Matt at the office and he'll get you on a list for when we do start those back up again. Okay, that sounds great. Um, I would love to see your farm and I imagine a lot of other people would too. So yeah. Okay, I don't see any other questions or comments at this time, but I sincerely want to thank you for the work you're doing and sharing it with us tonight and uh, giving us that little break from wherever we live and enjoying your part of the state. So thank you again. And uh, I think we can 
go ahead and sign out now as people are, oh, you've got to thank you very much. You're going to see quite a few of those. Um, wonderful presentation, thank you. So um, everyone here really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. And I'm glad to talk about flowers anytime. <laughs> <laughs> so are a lot of us. So that's yeah. a good combination. All right. Yeah. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night.